Hi, this is Arlene Weber from the Jefferson Valley Museum. Welcome to this special presentation of the annual meeting history program. Now we weren't able to do it live on April 2nd and once we're able to reschedule this I hope you'll join us for a live presentation. Let's go ahead and get started. our main presentation about the Jefferson Valley Museum barn. At the Jefferson Valley Museum, we're here to help preserve the past for the future. There are so many interesting people and things that have happened in our town and in our valley, and this museum is there to help you enjoy those past uh, people, events, uh, and items, just articles from our past that um, sometimes you just don't see anymore. So we'll go ahead and get started with just how our barn came to be the Jefferson Valley Museum. In 1915 there was a new business in town uh, and it was all being run out of this new barn. The barn was built in 1914 by Ike Pace. We don't know who he had build the barn, uh, but we do know that by March of 1915, his um, business uh, co-owner, uh, Mr. Wynn, was delivering milk to customers. And the milk at that time sold for 10 cents per quart. And if you wanted cream, you had to shell out a whole 30 cents per pint. But hey, this was top quality merchandise, so it was worth every penny. Now the whole time that a dairy business was run out of this barn, it was known as the Sanitary Dairy. And the last known person to operate a dairy business out of here was Al Smith. Uh, he ran that business from 1927 to 1937. There was also a 200 acre farm attached to the barn and that was leased to a number of operators over the years. Various people also lived uh, on the site including the John Stacy family and also in Su Chun. Mr. Chun grew garden produce and that was sold to many uh, markets uh, here in this part of Montana. Now, unfortunately, Mr. Chun died in the barn. Uh, we believe that the accident happened just across from where our current museum office is today. He was struck by a horse and unfortunately died from his injuries. If we look at the picture on the left, you can see the barn and many of the structures that existed when this photo was taken, including these three white houses on the left center of that picture. These were part of the Sugar Beet Row homes and those three houses are still there today. They've changed a little but same basic structures that existed a hundred years ago. In the picture on the right you can see the silos a little uh, clearer, some of the outbuildings and all of these buildings have been gone now for a very very long time. Now the, the barn, of course, was more than a place um, just for cattle and horses. It, it was a perfect place to hang up your deer or elk during hunting season, as you can see in this photo. And this was probably taken in the 30s or 40s. Um, the barn was already showing some pretty serious signs of neglect. But before it got to this stage of uh, disrepair, there had been a lot of uh, barn dances held up in the loft. Uh, so it was enjoyed for more than just milking a cow or two. Now in its heyday, the, the barn uh, was a home to horses and there was a granary. Uh, those were on the east side and on the west side of the barn there were up to 50 cows milked. The two silos that were on the west side used to be filled with sunflowers and that was used as silage. 
But as you can see in this photo, the roof was getting in pretty bad shape, so it was also now home to pigeons and a few bats. So our poor old barn really is showing signs of neglect. And if you look uh, up at the cupola, you can see there's some pretty serious damage showing up. The roof starting to get pretty bare. And you look through the window of uh, one of those up in the hayloft, you can see light. And that's light coming through missing shingles on the other side of the roof. In 1950, Basil and Team Brook purchased the barn, and Basil built a butchering plant south of the barn. Many of you probably remember the Brook Livestock Processing Plant. It was a familiar landmark if you were heading down the road towards Piedmont. So here's this old barn waiting for a new life, waiting for somebody to give it a purpose again. And in, right after the Whitehall celebrated centennial, there was an idea going around to create a museum for the town of Whitehall. Roy Milligan and a host of other people got this process started. Uh, they created a museum board and Doug Shaw served as president for a while. Uh, they were trying to decide where to have a museum. They knew it was an important thing to preserve Whitehall's history. But there were a lot of skeptics too. People were saying, hey, do these do they really know what they're getting into? And you know, this is gonna be an awful lot of work. But these group of volunteers was undaunted from the criticism. And here's a picture of some of those early volunteers who helped get our museum started. So after looking at a variety of potential sites. The dairy barn was eventually selected and Teen and Basil Brook donated the barn to the, the use of a museum back in 1991. Now they had looked at the old train depot, which would have been a great location, but well that burned down. And Earl Larson's garage would have been a nice size for a museum, but it was in too um, much of a residential area. There were homes all around it. It probably wouldn't have fit in well. So the old barn on the south of the tracks was finally selected as the best location. And in 1992, the work to transform this old dilapidated building into a museum was started. You can see Roy Milligan's car parked outside uh, doing the planning work that was going to be necessary to convert this into something that was a usable long-term building for the future museum. You can see what they had to start with or what little they had to start with back in 1992. The roof was in deplorable condition. There was a lot of it missing. That had to be fixed. The siding on the south side of the barn needed to be replaced in many places, and there was a lot of framing work that needed to be done. And on the south side of the barn in this open doorway, you can see there were several feet of cow manure on the ground floor. All of that had to be cleared out. Up in the loft, there were piles of old hay. There was a lot of pigeon droppings and leftovers from bats that had also lived in there. You can see in this photo of the hayloft, there wasn't much keeping the weather from getting clear through the loft area of this barn, and there were still piles of pigeon manure. All of this had to be manually removed and disposed of before any work could begin. On the main floor, there was a vast accumulation of old lumber, uh, doors, various pieces of whatever that had been discarded, uh, and remnants left over from when cows and horses had been kept in the barn. All this scrap material, all the junk, everything had to be pulled out of there and disposed of. 
There were a lot of people in the town of Whitehall that donated their time to clear this mess out so that the remodeling project could go forward. Once that was done, they were able to start working on turning this into a museum. One of the first things that had to be done was to get a new roof on there so that remodeling um, could take place inside the building. You can see this was a pretty daunting task, taking off the old sh shingles that had been on there for nearly a century and putting on a metal roof. Now fortunately, nobody was hurt during this process. It doesn't exactly look like the safest thing that was done in the remodel, but we're thankful that, it, that they were able to do it without any um, injuries taking place. Once the cupolas were fixed and the roof was on, this barn needed a good coat of paint and it was gonna take a lot of paint and a lot of time brushing on paint. Up in the loft on the left picture, you can see that there was um, a lot of issues with the siding. Uh, the roof wasn't completed here when this picture was taken. They had the windows boarded over. But once the roof was on and uh, windows were put in, they started laying a new floor in the loft. And this would become future storage for extra artifacts uh, that were not able to put on display at all at um, the same time. Down on the main floor, things were starting to shape up. If you look in the corner of the, uh, the door in the corner of the picture on the left, you can um, see that the, they cleared out the floor, they've laid gravel getting ready to put in concrete. And this area to the left of that door is where we have that huge piece of woodworking uh, equipment now that has the bandsaw and the table saw and all those other neat attachments with it. The ladder you see in this picture was the access they had to get up to the loft as they were working on that and, and getting that fixed up. The picture on the right shows the door that now goes out toward the Jardine building. This is on the north side of the barn. Our stairway that goes up to the loft now uh, went in right by this electrical panel that you see in that picture. So this now provides a safe and easy access to take things up or uh, back out of that loft storage area. Well, it took, took quite a while, but finally things were starting to shape up and it was starting to look like a place you could turn into a museum. On the right, you can see double doors uh, those, of course, are not the same doors we have today. And during our open season, those are, are always open so you can just easily walk into the back part of our barn displays. But you can see these beams all original to the structure. They were all able to be saved and cleaned up. On the right is the museum office. All the sheet rocking has been done, the taping and the painting. So it's really looking like a place you'd want to hang up hang around for a while. But outside, there was still a lot of work that needed to be done. The yard still had a lot of debris and weeds. All of that had to be removed and cleaned up. And they needed sewer and water lines run to the museum. So this, you can see this big trench being done, uh, dug out, uh, sewer and water being installed so that the museum could have running water and indoor restrooms for uh, visitors. And remember that most of the work, nearly all of it on this museum, was done with donated labor. For a while, while all this construction was going on, there was a sign outside that said, Future Home of the Jefferson Valley Museum. And it was out there for quite a while, but things were progressing and that dream was starting to get closer to being a reality. 
We were almost ready to open the Jefferson Valley Museum. They still needed to create a parking lot and fence in the museum grounds. Uh, there were several acres that went with the barn to allow for future expansion. So things were getting a little more exciting and a little more interesting. But there were still a few other things that had to be done before we could open the doors. You had to get artifacts and things were being donated. People were giving us all kinds of interesting things to put in this museum. And the main uh, fundraiser was the Walk of Names. People could purchase a board back at that time for $25 and have a name engraved into it. It was burned in, or carved into the wood. Each one of those boards had to be done by hand. Then each board was by hand put down into this boardwalk that you see around the museum today. And finally, in 1995, the barn was open as the Jefferson Valley Museum. At that time, the barn was the only building in the museum complex. But things got to uh, expand a little in just a few years. In 1999, August of that year, the museum received a $50,000 bequest from the John Jardine estate. John had been a great supporter of the museum and his bequest made it possible to build what we now call the Jardine Building. In August of 2000, that building opened and we were able to add quite a few new exhibits to the museum. In 2002, the Gilstrap blacksmith shop was moved from the South Boulder to the museum grounds and we also added an open front pole shed and that now houses our larger items, especially farm equipment and the stagecoach which you often see in Frontier Day parades. But in 2011 we almost lost it all. Flooding from the Pipestone Creek nearly took out our museum and it nearly wrecked all those years of work that started back in 1992. Now with help of many people from the community in the valley we were able to save the museum but the Walk of Names sustained major damage and the entire structure had to be replaced back in 2018. I like this picture of our seal Shaw standing in nearly knee deep water outside the museum and what's the parking lot. It just shows how stressful and almost desperate the situation seemed at the time with the flood water surrounding the museum, sections of the boardwalk floating. But again, thanks to local community members, Trenches were dug, the water was drained away from the building, and we were able to get back open and ready for another season. So the parking lot was expanded, uh, crushed rock was added, so we had adequate parking spaces, and a new addition was being planned uh, so that we could have even more exhibits because so many artifacts have been coming into the museum. So in 2015, between the museum building, the barn, and the Jardine building, a new structure was added. And this now houses our clothing collection, our maps, and a large collection of hand irons, or what many people still refer to as sad irons. If you've never been in the Jardine building, really encourage you to stop by and take a look at what we have. In the cowboy room there is this great collection of spurs. Nearly every one of these spurs is unique and most of them were probably made by different um, artisans at the time. And this belonged originally to Clyde Aiken. He was a longtime local resident. So come in and take a look at that as well as many of the vehicles, um, vintage vehicles, and many other items that uh, relate to our local history. Those are all in the Jardine building. 
Other great things that happen here, every year we have our annual Gab Fest. This usually takes place during Frontier Days weekend. And a lot of class reunions gather there. It's kind of fun to go through the museum and reminisce about things you remember from your childhood uh, when you're going to school here growing up. And it's a great place to just meet other people. Now in 2019, thanks to a grant, we were able to put an addition onto the Jardine building, which gave us a great new exhibit space. We've added a few more vehicles and we have other things planned to put in this automotive section of our museum. So I hope you'll stop by and see that. And grants are really an important part of our museum expansion. These allow for major projects and your support as a member helps us maintain the day-to-day -day operation of the museum and do smaller uh, projects and keep up on water and sewer and electric bills. Because remember, everyone at the museum is a volunteer. We have no paid staff. In 2018, again, thanks to a grant and a lot of donated labor, we were able to remodel the office and it really, really needed a remodel job. We now have some great workspace and plenty of shelf storage for documents and manuals and all kinds of records. So stop by um, when we're open or even in off season where many of us are there on Monday afternoons. We can probably help you with some of your historical research, whether it's family or business um, or just events that have happened in the past here in the valley. In 2019, we tore out that old carpet and had some new carpet installed again, thanks to a grant. So we are ready for our 25th season. So thankfully we are be being able to preserve the past for the future. And that includes this grand old barn that was built more than 115 years ago. Had it not become a museum, there's a very good chance that that barn would have looked a lot like the structure that you see in this picture in front of it. Just a collapsing pile of lumber that's been long forgotten of from the grandeur that it once held. So hopefully our season will open as planned. We'll wait and see. But as of right now, we are planning on opening May 23rd for the 25th season of the Jefferson Valley Museum. We will be open Tuesday through Sunday, noon to 4 p.m. And those hours will hold through September 15th when our 25th season will close. So please come and join us. We would love to have you come over and we'd gladly take you through the museum and point out the highlights of the history of the Jefferson Valley. Thank you for joining us today and I hope we'll see you at the museum sometime soon.